This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 30, Clients Into the Weeds, a podcast with myself and Matt Kelly, founder of Radical Compliance, where we take a deep dive into a compliance-related issue. Today, we geek out by looking at the SOX 404B debate. Matt has written an excellent post on it, and we take a deep dive into what are the requirements of SOX 404B in terms of internal controls reporting and how the potential changes to Sarbanes-Oxley really would not have much of an impact on this requirement. We take a look at what the requirements are and how they've been institutionalized into corporate compliance reporting since the passage of Sarbanes-Oxley. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and welcome for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds with my good friend and colleague, Matt Kelly, the founder of Radical Compliance. Today, we are going to geek out for you guys. Matt has written just a fabulous column entitled The Tale of Sound and Fury, the 404B Debate. So, Matt, with that, welcome. And can you tell us what is the 404 debate, why we should care about it, or should we even care about it? Uh, hello, Tom. Yeah, it's it's good to be here, and I swear I love writing about SOX 404B. Uh, this is like, I don't know, the compliance equivalent of writing about World War II. It will never go out of style. Um, so this refers to the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, Section 404, which requires two things. Section 404A requires all public companies, even non-accelerated filers, Management must assess the effectiveness of your internal control over financial reporting. So all companies that trade in the United States are subject to 404A. 404B requires an annual audit of internal control over financial reporting. If you are a non-accelerated filer, and those are public companies with a market cap of less than $75 million, you are exempt from 404B. The big debate that has been going on pretty much since Congress passed Sarbanes-Oxley in 2002 uh, is whether we should expand that exemption of 404B to many more companies. And now that the Republicans are in charge again, uh, Jeb Henserling, who is the quite conservative chairman of the House Financial uh, Services Committee, Uh, Jeb Henserling's new Financial Choice Act proposes expanding that exemption up to $500 million in market cap. You would not have to comply with 404B. That would be the vast majority of companies that trade in the United States and almost all companies except for large accelerated filers who are $750 million and above. So really, this is going to be only really big companies would then be subject to 404B if Jeb Henserling gets his way. So that's that's the debate so far. So the um, internal controls requirement came in, as you correctly noted, with Sarbanes-Oxley in 2002. So we've now had 15 years of not only internal control requirement, but requirement for uh, financial reporting around this uh, for, for U.S. public companies. Uh, whenever you have a 15-year period of financial controls and reporting on those financial controls, you not only have a, a growth industry around that for those companies that will uh, implement, design, create, and implement those those financial controls, but also a growth industry around those who will audit those. So we have companies that have specialized in that. We have professionals who have specialized in internal controls. But bu- above and beyond that, Matt, what I see is we have a company um, – a group of companies or a level of companies at above $75 million in market cap that have developed a much more sophisticated approach to financial reporting because of the requirements of SOX 404B. And I don't see that that really um, – that need or that sophistication and efficiency in business process is going to go away. You know, that is something that I think is going to factor in a lot to what the practical consequences are. Now, it is fair to say that for these mid-sized companies that are above the 75 million threshold, but they're not huge, they're not in the S&P 500, um, they have 
developed strong internal control over financial reporting, but they've done it kicking and screaming because it is not easy to do. And it especially was not easy to do in the middle 2000s when SOX compliance really first came into being that um, internal controls across the board were a mess and everybody spent many years trying to straighten them out. It could be quite expensive. And yes, there are companies, I talked to compliance and audit officers at these companies. There are companies that are maybe a billion or two billion in revenue. They've acquired themselves three or four units over the last eight years. They've got three or four different accounting systems. They'd like to go public, but they would have to straighten all of that out and get audits for SOX compliance if they wanted an IPO. So they're saying, well, geez, why would we bother doing this? Let's just sell out to private equity and we can all retire. And this is great. Um, There are companies that do that. At the same time, it is a proven fact. Research has shown that if you are exempt from 404B, you are more likely to experience a financial restatement at some point. So is it kicking and screaming for the company to build up its financial reporting? Or is it kicking and screaming the investors who might experience a restatement at some point in the future who will not appreciate that when they see losses uh, hitting their portfolio? That's really the debate here. Uh, The Republicans in Congress clearly think if we expand the exemption for 404B, many more small companies will be able to go public. We will make America great again. We will all be doing handsprings. And isn't that going to be Shangri-La? That is the Republican argument. Uh, It's not without some merits, but the investor and good governance activists do have a point that without tight internal control over financial reporting, you're more likely to experience uh, some sort of a financial restatement or other unwelcome event. And, you know, who are we serving here? Um, So that's where things stand. Well, you spoke, uh, if I could maybe restate that, that uh, there's really a trade-off, and certainly there's a trade-off between uh, putting the additional uh, obligation for financial controls in place and then requiring reporting on that with protecting investors. But the the thing I found most interesting about your piece, Matt, was that you basically said, not that it doesn't matter, but who cares? And uh, so I really wanted to, to get into the why why does this debate really matter other than ideologically or or politically because you raise some very interesting arguments or at least discussion points on why the market has changed so much uh in 15 years that this debate may be uh, really more than academic uh yeah i th- i think that it is there's a good degree of i guess academic debate to this uh, discussion right now that we it would have been very different if we'd had this discussion maybe around 2007. But what has changed since then? First off, a lot of these mid-sized companies that have gone public, they are 404B compliant. Maybe they don't like it. Maybe they wish they lived in a parallel world where this didn't come to pass. But in this world, they've already been doing these audits for a while. So first off, if the exemption somehow gets passed, which I am not convinced it would, but if it did, Uh, Are you going to be the first mid-sized company to tell the investing public, we're going to stop doing audits of our internal control because we just don't think it's worth it? Um, That's going to be a tough argument to make. It's going to be politically awkward to make that to your investors. Um, There will certainly be other companies that will still say, fine, but we are going to be be compliant. And mid-sized companies really do depend on institutional investors and mutual funds and uh, whatnot to be their big financial supporters. And these are the institutionals are the ones that want to see good financial reporting. Uh, It is, I would even say, a little bit less of a priority for large companies who will always be subject to it, but they have a much bigger mind share with retail investors who may or may not understand this, but, you know, the large companies are always going to be liquid. Mid-sized companies are going to need to maintain their liquidity. They're going to need the type of investors who care about 404B. So right there, that's one reason why I'm not sure companies would really embrace this idea of giving up 404B. Secondly, even if you did, there's going to be a lot of ways that you're not going to get to escape the substance of ICFR audits all that much. 
I'll give you a great example. And for legal officers and ethics and compliance officers who are a little fuzzy on this, I apologize. The internal auditors listening, you guys will get it. All audits of uh, internal control will include a look at your IT general controls. In theory, if 404B goes away, you're not going to have to look at those anymore. And isn't that nice? In practice, if you deal with customer data or personally identifiable information and you have to be PCI compliant, say to process credit card data from your customers or something like that, you're still going to need to audit your IT general controls. Um, so there's going to be a lot of ways that you just can't escape the nature of this work. I don't care what we're calling it, 404B or anything else. You know, it's still going to be there. It's still going to have to get done. Uh, we've seen advances in audit technology, especially where if you are leasing your accounting system from a cloud services provider, they are probably already providing 404B passable audits or uh, internal control systems anyways that, okay, you don't audit it, so therefore we can run a sloppier system and don't have to pay attention. That's not how it works anymore. You're going to get a good system because you're renting it from the cloud rather than building some hodgepodge system that uh, may or may not have a lot of controls and you know now we can skip that work. You're, you see less of that. I mean, we could dive into that more if we wanted, but I mean, people need to understand that the dynamics of what internal control and what has to be audited anyways, it's changed dramatically since we first started bither dickering over 404B compliance way back in the first term of the Bush administration. Um, so that's where we are. Well, and uh, although this is an audio-only podcast, I am going to visualize your point drawing from your blog post, which is, quote, the toothpaste is already out of the tube, end quote. And I think yeah. that really encapsulates it for a lot of reasons, Matt. It encapsulates it because it's not going to be, or, or what we've seen in anti-corruption compliance is a business response to a legal requirement. The SOX 404B mm -hmm. industry that has uh, grown up is the auditing and professional response to the legal requirements of SOX 404, both A and B. And the efficiencies and the business processes that have grown up to comply with SOX 404, both A and B, have uh, uh, given investors, uh, inst as you articulated institutional investors, and I would argue private equity investors, um, some comfort as to the financial sophistication, and more importantly, the efficiency and profitability of the companies they are purchasing. And if companies move away from, if they have the opportunity to move away from SOX 404 compliance, I think it's going to uh, end up with their value being discounted. And they'll be sold at discounts from companies that invest the two hundred and fifty or the five hundred thousand dollars annually uh, to do a full uh, SOX four hundred three four hundred four B audit. So the multiple in uh, values for either refinancing or uh, investment from private equity, I think, would more than pay back as an investment um, for such. Um, uh, control work. And so I really see a marketplace response to say, this is not something we as institutional and private equity investors want. The public retail investors are going to be protected. You're absolutely correct because of the size of the companies that uh, we <laughs> tend to invest in tend generally in, in the public arena tend to be fairly large. So they have those uh, requirements in place. But I, I think the business community, the financial investment community will demand a continual level of not only internal controls, but internal controls, auditing and reporting. And, you know, there's another dimension to this. We could tease out a little bit more. There are there are going to be two different types of companies that would face this. There are the pre-IPO companies who have never had to be 404B compliant, but may or may not be able to. And there are these mid-sized companies that already are public that have been 404B compliant, but now have the choice to move away from that. Think this through. If you're in that latter position, you also are subject to 404A, where management says, our internal controls are effective. Right. And now you've dropped the audits 
And now two years later, you have a restatement and you've been saying we're so confident that, you know, we're asserting the effectiveness, but we're not getting it audited anymore. If you have a restatement, you know, the shareholder litigation lawyers will come after you guns blazing and you will have nowhere to hide. Um, I think that you know, if you are a company that has already been public, you don't like 404B, I'm really I'm hard pressed to see what's the logic in dodging it anyways now. I know it's a bit of a drain and I know that for mid-sized companies it is relatively expensive. Um, and one last detail here, I think another part of Jeb Henserling's litigation or legislation is that banks with less than one billion dollars in assets would also be exempt from 404B. There's this whole other class of concern about Dodd-Frank and Sarbanes-Oxley really landing with both feet on small community banks. And that's a valid point to bring up about these laws, that community banks have really taken it in the face. And I wouldn't be surprised if we somehow see the Sox 404B exemption wind up applies to community banks based on their assets. But if you are a mid-sized company, I don't know that we're going to see much of an exemption there. Um, this may be a give and take strategy Hen Serling is trying to do for what he really wants, which is to help out community banks as part of a bigger Dodd-Frank Sarbanes-Oxley reform. And I don't know where the middle market companies would fall there. So that really speaks to a point you have articulated um, at least through 2017 and probably back a little bit earlier after the uh, election in November, which it's uh, really access to, to capital that um, it's going to be the driving force in congressional attempts to cut back on Dodd-Frank. But the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley um, financial protections came in because of corporate accounting scandals. So we didn't have uh, banks defrauding customers. Uh, we had corporations defrauding their own shareholders, their employees, uh, and other stakeholders through fraudulent accounting. And the response that I see in the secondary market, the private equity market, uh, even if you want to do a bank loan, uh, you have to have a rigorous level of financial controls and financial reporting. And uh, that access to markets, uh, excuse me, that access to capital through those markets uh, is what Sarbanes Oxley speaks to, and I, I just do not see um, the marketplace calling for that type of uh, legislative response at this point. I think the marketplace likes having uh, that level of uh, rigor and detail in even seventy-six million dollar capped companies, as opposed mm -hmm. to uh, to something else. So um, it it's uh, market driven uh, at this point, and and really you you. You put down a couple of markers about the differences between 2004 and 2017 and what's available, uh, both in technology and sophistication. But let me just throw out another uh, thing that um, I like to think about a lot, which is the COSO 2013 framework. Uh, we have both yep. studied that at, at some length, and, and you are, <clears throat> say, a little more familiar with the ERM framework. But those frameworks are uh, either good governance, good financial controls, or good something, uh, processes that companies should follow. And I can't see that an investor would want to cut back on the information that's made available to them, uh, either by, uh, uh, by a, a legislative response that says to companies, you don't have to do this anymore. I think that's very true. And, um, you know, I think another thing that people have to consider is what's been the economic climate, especially since 2007 or eight. It's been low interest rates have really driven huge amounts of merger activity. So you do have companies floating around today that are this amalgamation of a bunch of M&A deals over the last 10 years. You've got four or five or more different accounting systems. Uh, the record I heard from one big pharmaceutical firm was they had 55 different accounting systems. Mm. And how can you assure that you have strong financial reporting with so many different accounting systems? It's really difficult. Now, yes, if you are being bought and sold by private equity, there may be a certain I don't have to care. It's the next guy's problem if I sell it before the systems blow up. You know, I mean, there's some passing a hot potato along that I think goes on. But if a 
buyer is a long-term player and you see that your holding is a mishmash of different accounting systems you're going to want to straighten out, you're going to want to straighten them out. And people will find that looks quite like going through a SOX 404 compliance process. And I, so like I said before, I don't know that this solves all that much. This is a solution now in search of a problem that I think certain Republicans like to believe there's a problem of companies going public that is attributable to 404B. I don't know how true that really is. Well, Matt, unfortunately, we're uh, at the end of our time, but this has been just a, a fascinating discussion with you. I really like the approach you take where um, you really t- detail for us several different reasons that the debate which uh, the debate we would have had in 2002 and 2004 is frankly very different now. Uh, the marketplace yeah. is very different, and the reasons for even an ideological uh, response uh, are not the same as they were at that time frame. So uh, kudos for putting this one up. All right. Thank you, Tom. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. If you have listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate us as it would help our rankings and help get the word out about this podcast where we take a deep dive into the compliance weeds. Thank you very much for listening.